Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Donna Emma, co-chair of Mass General Hospitals Leadership Council for Psychiatry. And I, as well as my fellow co-chair, Patty Ribikoff, welcome you to Palm Beach for the 17th Annual Psychiatry Seminar. We have a thoughtfully packed program for you today filled with many important discussions around mental health innovation. And there will be plenty of opportunity for you to engage and ask questions. We're particularly excited to hear from an MGH patient who has generously offered to share her story with all of us. But before we kick things off and learn more about important topics like ADHD, OCD, and mood disorders, I'd like to personally thank all of you for attending and for continuing to advocate <clears throat> for those who suffer from mental illnesses and often do so in silence. There is no doubt that mental illness is an ongoing endemic in our country, one exacerbated by not only the pandemic, but also the countless other burdens which families are currently facing. The ongoing support and guidance from many in this room is critical to improving mental health care. Flexible philanthropy is essential to the success of the Department of Psychiatry's work. It provides unique opportunities for Dr. Fava and Mass General's, General's leadership to seed pioneering science. It's been three years since we were able to gather like this. There's a renewed enthusiasm when we're no longer stuck in a virtual format, and you can truly feel that here today. I'm so proud to be a co-chair of the Leadership Council with Donna, we inherited these roles in February of 2020, days before the world changed dramatically. Since then, the need for psychiatric care has grown exponentially, making the work of the council more necessary than ever. We must continue to increase knowledge and round mental illness and improve access and treatment. Since our establishment in 20 in 2007, council members have given approximately $60 million to, to the Department of Psychiatry, helping to launch new programs, train the next generation of healthcare providers, increase representation, and support our current faculty's innovative work. Today, we celebrate those efforts with a rich and informative program. I encourage everyone to refer to your program book that would have been found right on your chair there. Uh, we have the slides baked in there if you want to make any notes um, for more details regarding today's agenda. To start the morning off, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Maurizio Fava. If you didn't know it, Dr. Fava is Mass General Psychiatrist-in-Chief and a world leader in the field of depression. We are so fortunate to have him lead the charge. Under his direction, the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General continues to break new ground in mental health care and improve the lives of hundreds of patients. Welcome, Dr. Fava. Thank you so much. Let me see you here. Thank you so much, Patty and, and Donna, for the well, warm welcome. We're so fortunate to rely on your leadership, especially as we continue uh, to battle a, a national mental health crisis. And thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. You know, on a day in the sunny, warm weather, I'm sure, you know, we're all tempted to be outside. And I really appreciate that you're here instead. Um, many of you have heard last night uh, at dinner uh, when we spoke about the importance of the work of our department and of your support. Today, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity uh, for all, all of us to hear directly from the sources. Uh, the people and the programs that have directly benefited from your support and generosity. As Patty and Donna mentioned, I'm going to try to give you a sense of, uh, you know, uh, the program this morning. Uh, we have a very engaging full program. Uh, you'll, you'll hear from Dr. Joan Camprodron, who's director of the Division of Neuropsychiatry and, the, and of the Laboratory for Neuromodulation. She's going to talk about ADHD and new opportunities in research that may be changing the, the treatment paradigms for this, for this condition. Dr. Erica Greenberg uh, will share her personal journey uh, to come to care for adolescents with, uh, in the 
pediatric OCD and tick disorders program, which he directs. Dr. Jonas Smaller uh, will talk about the recent advances that have been made in, the, in his uh, brand new Center for Precision Psychiatry, which, by the way, just uh, is about to obtain $50 million of funding from the federal government. Uh, so it's uh, congratulations. And, um, and lastly, Dr. Anna Maria Vranciano, um, who's the founding director of the uh, uh, Center for Health Outcomes and Interdisciplinary Research, or CHOIR, uh, who's going to talk about um, the, her work focused on the importance of treating not only the body and mind, but also the patient and their loved ones. You also have the opportunity to hear from um, Kitty Sprague, who's a patient of Dr. Lee Cohen, who's the director of the Edmund Pinizado Center for Women's Mental Health and Associate Chief of Psychiatry. Kitty has uh, generally offered to share a story of recovery and uh, we're really looking forward uh, to it. Their remarks will be followed by uh, a Q&A uh, moderator by our Associate Chief uh, uh, John Herman. Uh, during this time, you'll have the opportunity to uh, ask both Kitty and, and Dr. Cohen uh, questions about their shared journey uh, together and the relationship between, between them. And to conclude the morning, uh, we're excited to gather all of the presenters for a panel, a panel discussion. Uh, Lee and I will join them. We're we'll able to take any questions you have about the work we do or psychiatry, psychology. Uh, we'll be open to, to that. I'm incredibly, you know, incredibly proud of our team. You know, it, it, it was an honor when I uh, became chair of the department uh, to take over a department that Jerry has, you know, kind of transformed over the years, but it's continuing to grow. Uh, since I became, ch you know, chair of the department, our research funding has increased by more than 60% in a little bit more than three years, which is extraordinary. As you will shortly uh, uh, witness yourself, uh, the speaker's passion for their craft and compassion for the patients are tangible. And it is what really makes Mass General a distinct and unique place. Uh, I can tell you because I'm a patient myself, and that is, you know, clearly something that makes Mass General different from any other place uh, that I, I, at least I've, I've ever encountered. Their collaborative spirit allows for walls to be broken, great discoveries to be made, and advances in mental health uh, care that will, without a doubt, change our world for the better. And all of this is possible because of your support, um, because of you. And uh, we're a family, and today's seminar will prove just that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joanne Camperdon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mauritian. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to um, get us started. So, I will talking. I will be talking today about um, a couple of things. I will be talking about neuropsychiatry and what that is. I will be talking about neuromodulation. It's a new area of treatments that use devices. They don't use medications or psychotherapy, but machines. Machines that can change brain activity, and by doing so, they can treat brain-based disorders. And then I'll talk about how we can do that to improve cognitive disorders, and specifically ADHD as a paradigm of cognitive disorders that affects children and adults, um, and for which we have some medications and some behavioral therapies, but they're only partially effective. So neuropsychiatry, not, always, not everyone knows what neuropsychiatry is, so I'd like to start by just framing it. So, you know, often I get asked, but what's the real difference between neurology and psychiatry? And it's difficult sometimes to pinpoint it in a definition that is explicit, that is clear, that separates the two. And the reason is because that separation is artificial, right? So at the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't have neurology and psychiatry. We had neuropsychiatry. 
people like Alzheimer's or, or Kreplin, these physicians, they were pathologists and neurologists and psychiatrists. But through the course of the 20th century, the two specialties separated. And now we're seeing a trend to come back, to get them back together. And what's driving that coming back together is actually neuropsychiatry. And it's not just science, it's also patient care. It's an approach, it's a brain-based focused approach to taking care of patients, to thinking about the diagnosis, to thinking about treatments. So certainly understanding the brain is very clinically important for neuropsychiatry and for psychiatry in general. But it's not just theoretically important, it's important from the standpoint of treatments. We have three main types of treatments in psychiatry and in neurology. We have medications. The medications affect the brain at the level of molecules, at the level of neurotransmitters. We have psychotherapy. Psychotherapy affects the brain at the level of behavior, cognition, emotion. And then we have brain stimulation, what I will be talking about today, that affects the brain at the level of brain circuits. It meets the brain where it's at. The brain uses electricity to communicate, electricity to create emotions, to create attention, to create behaviors. And we're trying to change that very electricity in a way that can be non-invasive, not painful, and very safe. So there's a whole set of technologies and treatments that we call brain stimulation. And we tend to classify them in these three groups that you see here. Some are surgical, that means it's like a pacemaker, it's implanted in the chest, it's a battery, it's a computer, only that the leads don't go to the heart, they go to the brain. And that's used to treat conditions like Parkinson's disease or dystonia, also OCD. It's because it's very invasive, so that's not for L patients. We have another group of therapies that are not surgical, they don't need a scalpel, but they still do need general anesthesia. These are the convulsive therapies. These are things like ECD, which is still the gold standard to treat conditions like depression. So we have the surgical ones, the convulsive ones, and now we have the non-invasive ones. These are techniques that also use devices, but we don't need a surgery, we don't need general anesthesia. It can be done in an ambulatory setting, meaning patients come to the clinics, they can drive themselves in, they get the treatment, and then go back home. Um, and it can even be done at home, like I'll discuss today. So it's a, it's a bit of a revolution, a paradigm shift in how we are thinking about therapies, particularly we, we can bring these devices that are high-tech innovations to be treatments that patients do at home. So this opens an opportunity really to treat cognitive disorders. Cognitive disorders in general are very, very prevalent across neurological and psychiatric conditions. We see problems with cognitions in depression, in bipolar disorder, in schizophrenia, in addictions, in traumatic brain injury, in personality uh, disorders, in stroke, in Parkinson's disease, of course, in Alzheimer's and dementias. Um, and we're not very good at treating cognitive deficits. Why are we not very good at treating cognitive deficits? Because the systems in the brain that process cognitions, memory, attention, language, they're not very specific from a neurochemical perspective. That means there isn't something specific about those brain regions chemically that allows us to use chemicals like drugs, like pharmaceuticals, medications, to engage them, to change them, to get them better. That said, those systems are very, very specific from an anatomical perspective. We know the brain regions that are engaged in processing attention or memory. They're, chemically, they're not very different from the others, but anatomically, they're very different from the others. So we can leverage that anatomical specificity. We have a challenge, we have a window to get those areas to work better, to work well, and therefore to treat cognitive deficits. And that's precisely what we can do with brain stimulation. We can leverage that anatomical precision, change the patterns of brain activity, and get them to work better, to be more adaptive. So poor chemical specificity, great anatomical specificity. So let me get you started with a, a case to just make things more specific and more real. Uh, this is one of my patients. It's Paul C. Call him like this. He's a 24-year-old recent graduate um, of college, college graduate. He has a diagnostic of ADHD since childhood. So as a child, he was having some trouble in school. He was having trouble paying attention. He was a very edgy and fidgety kid. Um, it wasn't clear if he didn't want to deploy effort. He was interested in other things, um, if he was behaviorally problematic until we figure out that he had ADHD. And we started with first with behavioral therapies, then some medication therapies. And he got well to a certain extent. Uh, attention got better. Some of the hyperactivity got better, but executive function did not get better. His capacity to 
plan activities, to multitask efficiently, to get started with a project when it's taking some effort, to wrap up the last details of a project. That did not get better. And we know that these medications improve attention and hyperactivity, but these executive functions, which are critical to function well, they don't touch them. Again, because they're not chemically specific, but they're anatomically specific. In addition, these medications work for some symptoms, but they also cause some trouble. He was not eating so well, he lost weight, um, and uh, he wasn't sleeping so well. So we had to start thinking about alternatives. So this is a problem, it's a challenge. It's also an opportunity to think about novel strategies to treat patients like Paul. So can we offer a treatment that improves executive function in a way that medications do not? Can we do that in a way that it's not causing side effects? So this has to be treatment that is not systemic. When we take a medication, we take it orally, it goes to our stomach, it goes to our gut, it goes to the blood, then goes to the liver, to the lungs, to the heart, to your fat tissue, to your muscle, and to the brain, but it goes everywhere in the brain. Can we have a treatment that goes only to the brain, and in fact, only to the parts of the brain that we actually want to stimulate? And more than that, can we do that at home so that patients don't have to come every day to the clinic? so that they can continue with their lives and use the benefits of these therapies to just be more adaptive, to work, to go to school, to socialize, to be with the family, etc. So introducing this, yes, we can start doing that. So I'm going to talk about this one specific um, space of brain stimulation, it's transcranial electric stimulation. So what you can see here on the left side is a cartoon, but I actually have some of these devices that I brought with me, so I'll do a little demo. So as you can see here, um, there's two electrodes. There's a positive and a negative. So it's like anode and a cathode. And we put this on the surface of the head. Something like this. There's a strap. And these yellow and blue electrodes are carbon electrodes. They're not metallic. They don't hurt. And they have a sponge around them that is soaked in saline, basically water and salt, that allows the conduction of electricity. So this is placed like this on the head. I have one on the left frontal cortex and one on the right frontal polar cortex. I have this on the back. I would connect this here. Uh, we we'll turn it on and treatment starts. And I can do this for 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day. I can do it in the morning. I can do it in the afternoon. I can do it while I'm reading the news. I can do it while I'm watching TV. It's very safe. It doesn't hurt. Sometimes we may feel a little tingling sensation, um, but it's, it's not painful. Just so you know that some of the current is going through the saline. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm actually using this positive electrode to increase the excitability, to increase the electrical activity of the left prefrontal cortex, which is that anatomical selectivity. I'm not affecting my liver. I'm not affecting my muscles. I'm not affecting the back of the brain or the side of the brain. I'm just affecting the part of the brain that I need to affect. There's other systems. There's other ways of doing this. So there's also this cap form, which you just put like this, put like that. You have the two electrodes, you turn it on, and treatment gets started. So we can use current in different ways. We can have direct current. We can have more um, um, complex form of currents, like oscillating current, like the one that comes out of the circuit. And we can put in different ways, and we can even individualize it so that we can, at the individual patient's level, make sure that we're increasing the power of the brain that not is just important for the disease, but it's important for that one individual. And some of our um, early work motivating our treatment development started with ADHD. And we wanted to see by doing that, we actually were able to improve attention, improve cognitive control in patients with ADHD. And if we were able to do that, how were we doing this biologically? So these are data, and I'm just gonna walk you quickly through it. So we stimulate patients on the left side or on the right side, or we did placebo. And on the left side, um, we have green as before stimulation and blue as after stimulation. And we saw that after one session, we were able to improve attention only for the left, not for the right, not for the placebo. 
And we saw that when we did that is because there was a specific part of the brain, signature of the brain, that's called the P300, that we were able to improve only for the left, not for the right, not with placebo, which led us to think that stimulating the left not only improved the cognitive functions of ADHD, but we had a biomarker that guide us how we plan treatment. We know that the specific P300, this physiological signature that is critical when we get patients better is because we move that dial. Um, so this got us started on a treatment study. Um, and we have actually a couple of treatment studies. This is a study we just published with Dr. Leffa, who's in our group. It was a study that was just published in JAMA Psychiatry. It's a, um, a journal in psychiatry that show that yes, that TDCS done actually at home is better than placebo. It works clinically. We're doing more work in this space, but we're not only doing work for ADHD, we're also doing work for other conditions like ADHD that have executive deficits. For example, the cognitive deficits of long COVID, the mental focus of long COVID. We're seeing so many patients in neuropsychiatry with these deficits. It's unclear what it is. It's unclear how to treat them. We're starting to see that these approaches are good to treating the cognitive deficits of long COVID. And they're also good to treat the cognitive deficits of other psychiatric conditions and neurological conditions, just like Alzheimer's disease. So again, it's a new space of therapeutics. It's a new space of treatments. It can be done non-invasively. It's not painful. It can be done at home. And it's uniquely effective to improve cognitive disorders, ADHD, but not only ADHD. Things like long COVID, things like the cognitive of depression, of psychosis, and so on. So thank you very much. <laughs>
And then with mentorship and support from Mass General Psychiatry and collaborating neurologists, I am where I am today. And so today, I want to tell you more about our program and why we do what we do. Millions of children in the U.S. are impacted by tic disorders, including Tourette syndrome, and OCD and related disorders. And with this, we often see a negative impact on self-esteem, academics, peer relationships, and family life. Our pediatric program at MGH is the only dedicated child psychiatry program to Tourette syndrome and related disorders in Massachusetts, and one of only a handful in the US. So when people hear obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, often their first thought is hand washing or needing to keep things organized. While those are certainly possibilities in kids, the presentation is actually usually more commonly different. Many of the youth who come to us struggle with stuck intrusive thoughts, things that they don't want to think about, but that they just can't get out of their heads. Or they may struggle with needing constant reassurance. For example, are you sure that's okay? Are you sure that you're sure? Are you sure that you're sure? Or what I like to call the but what ifs. Also, many struggle with elaborate rituals where they have to do something either to stop something else bad from happening or until it feels just right. By the time these youth get to us, their symptoms are not uncommonly taking hours a day, interfering with school, friends, and significantly impacting the family. Other conditions in the OCD family that we see include repetitive hair pulling or skin picking, where the child often wants to stop but can't, and body dysmorphic disorder, um, where there's excessive problematic focus on a specific body part. As I mentioned earlier, we also treat children and adolescents with tic disorders. So first, what are tics? They're brief, repetitive, non-purposeful movements or sounds that are somewhere between voluntary and involuntary, or as we say, involuntary. Like the feeling before having to scratch an itch, or before you sneeze, or before you yawn. Some tics are simple, like blinking, shrugging, or sniffing, and some are complex and appear more purposeful, like running one's hand through one's hair, certain bending movements, or having to say certain words or phrases. Tourette syndrome, which is a childhood onset neuropsychiatric disorder, is defined by having only two motor tics at least, and at least one vocal tic for at least a year. So now, with that said, 90% of individuals with Tourette syndrome have at least one co-occurring psychiatric disorder. So about two thirds of youth with Tourette syndrome will have either ADHD um, or OCD, and about a third will have all three. Often though, the symptoms don't fit as neatly into the buckets as they're supposed to, uh, making diagnosis and treatment a lot more difficult. I found this problem of these in-between symptoms and complex symptom patterns fascinating and I became increasingly interested in helping these youth with these multiple co-occurring conditions and complex presentations. I began adapting my language to focus on what so many of these kids described. Uh, sorry. Uh, that they weren't doing something to stop something bad from happening. They were doing it because they had to. They described feeling like if they didn't, they were going to explode. Parents whose children are experiencing this often reported explosive meltdowns and hours of the day lost because they were experiencing this um, need for just right. That particular symptom, which we often refer to as Tourette OCD or tick-like OCD, reminded me of my brother, who would become fixated on something that he didn't want to buy, he needed to buy, or else he would explode. These were not the simple compulsions that we learned about in training. Taking it a step further, while leading a study looking at behavioral treatments tailored specifically for youth with tics and co-occurring ADHD, I noticed that many of the participants would describe having to do the thing they least wanted to do, and that doing so would ultimately be both satisfying and deeply upsetting. For example, powering off a video game just before they're about to beat a level, or pushing on a bruise, or in the middle of a swim meet having to breathe in um, right before they're about to win. These behaviors, which we named intrusive destructive behaviors or IDBs, had properties of tics, intrusive thoughts, compulsivity, impulsivity, disinhibition, and hadn't previously been specifically characterized in the literature. Last year, after publishing and presenting on it nationally, patients from around the country reached out to me to say how validated they felt to be seen and know they're not alone, and that this is something for which they can seek help. 
And so, not infrequently, a parent will present with their child to our program and describe having received diagnoses of tics, OCD, hair pulling, skin picking, executive dysfunction, ADHD, mood disorder, anxiety, rage, sensory hypersensitivity, learning differences, and social struggles. It is really hard. So I'm often asked, why do we see all of these symptoms and syndromes together? And perhaps we are missing something, because how could one child have so many diagnoses? Well, there is a reason that we see all these syndromes and symptoms together. It's because they all are indeed connected through their association with this frontal cortical striatal thalamal cortical or CST circuitry. What's so interesting about this circuit is that it's in charge of regulation, meaning that when it's functioning the way it should, it helps regulate one's movements, attention, emotion. But when it's not, one sees dysregulation and disinhibition. In the kids that we see, it's not that they can't concentrate, it's that they can't regulate concentration. It's not that they necessarily have a mood disorder per se, it's that they can't regulate um, their mood um, and will have you know, very big emotions. Uh, so with parents, I often like to say that their kids feel strongly. And so for parents, I ultimately explain while, that while there are multiple diagnoses listed on paper, it's really one underlying circuitry problem that's manifesting in all these multiple domains. However, to you know, Dr. Campadone's point, the state of the art currently in our treatments is that despite all of these being connected, we currently require different treatments for the different diagnoses. And so given that, I'm often asked, where do you start? Well, let me tell you about Cooper. Cooper's name and some small details are changed, but mom recently gave me permission to share his success story. Cooper, a sweet, sensitive, artistic young boy, first came to me in the third grade. He had frequent bothersome neck and eye tics, OCD symptoms where he couldn't say um, or um, write certain numbers or words, and um, he was also reassurance seeking for hours a day. His teachers reported that despite his aptitude, he was almost two years behind in reading and math as he simply couldn't focus. He also had explosive episodes and trouble sleeping. Parents had tried everything they could, nutritional changes, exercise, supplements, but ultimately they came in as the struggles were just too intense, though they were still understandably very nervous about medication. In situations like this, we start by asking, what is most bothersome and impairing to the patient? Cooper found his tics extremely frustrating and upsetting. And so we started by addressing those with a very low dose of an alpha agonist, clonidine uh, blood pressure medicine. We also connected Cooper with MGH behavioral therapy expert and got him into neuropsychological testing. The medicine helped and his tics dramatically improved. Six months later, it became increasingly clear the degree to which Cooper's ADHD symptoms were impairing his functioning. We spoke about certain medications, such as stimulants and alpha agonists, are shown to be synergistic in kids with Cooper's profile, and that stimulants are safe to take for ADHD, even in those that have tics. We ultimately started a low dose of a stimulant, and Cooper did great. And Cooper and this regimen we maintained for a year. However, over time, despite working so hard in therapy, um, Cooper's OCD was just too difficult. Um, shortly before our last visit, mom reached out and said, I think we're at the point where we want to try that medication for OCD. We had previously spoken about this as an option at a previous appointment. Mom said that Cooper came to her the other day and said, please, mom, there has to be something else I can try to help with this. The therapy was helping, but just not enough. We ultimately started 10 milligrams of fluoxetine or Prozac. And when I saw them one month ago, and I asked how things are, mom's eyes started welling up. And Cooper, one who's typically a man of few words said, I'm amazing. This is the best I have ever felt. And, um, and that was when mom actually suggested that I share the story of his journey uh, and the family's journey. And so putting it all together, another important takeaway is that the patient is more than just the child sitting in front of you. In order to provide the best care, you need to fold in the parents, the siblings, the school, the teacher. You need to listen to the patients and the families and their experiences. Treatment, especially for complex conditions that we see in our program, are not a one size fits all. 
the more we learn from our patients, the more we can research and develop the tools that can help. For example, published clinical research studies above that focus on the tailored approaches for these complex symptom profiles. It's an exceptionally exciting time for pediatric OCD and tic disorders as a field we're on the precipice of multiple new understandings and discoveries. Research in this area generally falls into three buckets. Patterns we see clinically, what exists beneath those patterns, genetics, neurocircuitry, microbiome, and what novel treatments can come from those findings, including the drive towards precision medicine. And so I think it's important to step back and acknowledge that in my role, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in psychology, psychiatry, neurology fields. As director of the Pediatric Psychiatry, OCD, and Tick Disorders program at Mass General, I'm proud to carry the torch forward. Ultimately, it's my mission and vision to build a comprehensive, coordinated, collaborative, and personalized one-stop shop for these patients and families affected by tick and OCD spectrum disorders, where a patient can present for initial evaluation with one of our psychiatrist clinicians and have the chance to work with a team of therapists, social workers, support groups, and have access to leading edge treatments and clinical research trials. And so this brings me back to where I started. I wish that this depth of information was available to my brother, my parents, and my family 20 years ago. And with help from my patients and collaboration with colleagues at Mass General, it's my mission and vision that we are soon in a place where we can look back at 2023 and say, I can't believe how much we've grown since then. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have to say something. So don't leave yet, Erica. So looking out at uh, an audience many years ago, I think it was in Brookline, yep. Massachusetts, there was a young woman who was in college or starting college. In between. At the end. And it was uh, an event like this where we had talks. And so I've known Erica since she was in that audience since she went to college and to medical school and to residency and then fellowship and now here she is so when we're looking and i'm particularly looking at some of our young people out there in this group uh things happen over time they stand on the shoulders of giants you in the council and you young people so now i'm challenging you for that so this is what you see thank you Eric. Oh. Jordan. So first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Patty and Donna and the, the council for this opportunity. It's really um, a privilege to talk with you all. I want to talk with you about the idea of precision psychiatry and how that may improve the outlook for mood disorders which are very common. And, the, and actually, because they're so common, the chances are one in four of us in this room has had or will have a mood disorder at some point in our lives. So that means depression or bipolar disorder. What do I mean by the challenge of mood disorders? Well, I think I have the wrong clicker here. Uh, let me give you some facts that sort of tell that story. Depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide. Bipolar disorder, on average, it takes about six to 10 years from the time somebody starts having symptoms to when they get the correct diagnosis. Most people with mood disorders don't get treatment. And when treatment is given, it is often a sort of trial and error process that can take months. One of the uh, of course, terrible complications of these disorders is the problem of suicide, which is actually the second leading cause of death among young people. And we've actually seen nearly a 60% increase in youth suicide in the last 15 years. So as a clinician, every week uh, I confront the challenges or limitations of what we uh, face with these conditions. And let me give you an example that's not atypical. It's a patient, uh, Megan B., who was a school teacher 
in her early 20s who began having depression uh, about a year ago. And she started this process of trial and error with her prior clinician trying to find the right medications, went through a series of, of medication options with limited benefit. And after about six months, she ended up making a, a suicide attempt, ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and after discharge, couldn't really return to work and ultimately had to take a leave from her job and go on disability. And this is unfortunately not a very uncommon story. And I've highlighted a couple of aspects of her history that sort of highlight places where maybe we could do better. So first of all, what if we could choose the best treatment from the start and not have to go through this trial and error process? Could we predict and prevent suicidal behavior? Could we even predict and prevent mood disorders from beginning in the, in the first place? So about two years ago, we established the Center for Precision Psychiatry to try to find new ways to address these and other urgent challenges. And our motto is, or our mission is to drive innovation to implementation. That means to bridge this gap between research discoveries and clinical practice by using big data and 21st century tools to help us better diagnose and treat and prevent illness. And it's actually part of a paradigm shift in medicine more generally called precision medicine. And the idea, and this has actually already had transformative uh, successes in areas like cancer and heart disease. So the idea is to move beyond this one size fits all trial and error approach by targeting individual differences in our biology and lifestyle and environments to do better with how we treat or prevent or diagnose disease. And the fact is that um, most of the treatments that we have are still based on what works for the average person. But of course, none of us is the average. We are all unique. So one of the tools that we now have at our disposal is artificial intelligence. And you've probably heard some about artificial intelligence recently in the news. Actually, we mainly encounter it with companies that are trying to predict what it is that we're gonna like or wanna buy. So social media companies like uh, Twitter or Facebook use it to predict uh, what do we wanna see in our feed. Uh, Netflix or Spotify use it to, to, to sort of predict what videos or music we would like. And the way they do this is by analyzing vast amounts of data about people's behavior and then building algorithms or models that can predict future behavior. But the good news is that those same tools are now available in healthcare settings to help us predict more, you know, to predict important outcomes or to support clinicians and patients in making better decisions about what to do. And one of those decisions is what to do when you're trying to pick a medicine, for, for example, for a patient like Megan. So let's imagine two patients, Megan and another patient, Tom. And when we are selecting an antidepressant, let's say they are coming to us with depression, we typically have four different kinds of medicines that we think of first line. An SSRI, like Prozac or Lexapro, an SNRI, which would be something like uh, Effexor, Bupropion, which is also known as Welbutrin, and Remeron or uh, Mirtazapine. So those are our, usually our first four main choices. Now, interestingly, the best studies show that the the probability on average that somebody's going to respond to one of those medicines is actually the same across all those medicines. So that's what we have to go on. And typically what we do is we start with one, we start this trial and error process and hope that it works. But if it doesn't, after a couple of months, we move on to another strategy. So to try help change that, we recently used electronic health records and artificial intelligence to develop an artificial intelligence model with data from 17,500 patients to predict which medicine or what's the likelihood that somebody's gonna respond in the four to 12 weeks after they begin treatment. 
And um, this is uh, this is results uh, that you're seeing on the bottom there for the SSRI. And um, the model actually correctly predicts what the treatment outcome is likely to be about 75% of the time, which is better than what we're doing now. And what you see here, interestingly, is for Tom, the model predicts that he has a 94% chance of responding to an SSRI, which is great. But for Megan, it's only 28%. So if we started with an SSRI, that might be pretty good for Tom. The beauty of this model or this approach is that we can ask, well, what should we do? If an SSRI doesn't work for Megan, what should we try? And the model's key sort of advance is being able to predict response to different antidepressants. So I don't know how clearly you could see this, but for Tom, most of them are going to work pretty well. And the SSRI is actually the best choice. But for Megan, it turns out we would have been better off starting with the Remeron. So you can see that if you had this kind of information up front, you might spare people potentially months of uh, trial and error treatment. Another area that we've really focused on and applied these kinds of tools to is the problem of suicide, which as I've mentioned is a leading cause of death. And amazingly, rates of suicide have not dropped in a century and sometimes have really increased a lot. Um, we actually do have methods for preventing self-harm, but we're not very good at knowing who's really at risk. And uh, it turns out that studies have shown that we clinicians do no better than chance at identifying who's really at high risk. So um, a few years ago, we began using the vast resource of electronic health record data along with artificial intelligence, again, to build powerful new risk prediction models uh, that can identify uh, people who are at the highest risk. And with support from the Tommy Fuss Fund, we developed a model that could predict suicide attempts using data for about 2 million patients. And the model was able to detect 45% of all attempts on average two to three years in advance. We then showed that this approach worked just as well in five other healthcare systems around the country. And we went on to do an extensive economic analysis to ask how good would a model like this have to be for it to be cost effective to use in primary care. And in fact, the results showed it would be cost effective to do if you pair it with proven methods of suicide prevention. And then more recently, we conducted a very large study in our emergency department, almost 2000 patients, who had come in and they were seen by clinicians. We asked the clinicians, what do you think is the chance that this patient is going to make a suicide attempt in the next month? And then we compared that to what the algorithm predicted. And um, once again, the results were sort of sobering. Clinicians performed no better than chance, but the algorithm clearly outperformed. And that's not surprising uh, because this kind of big data artificial intelligence approach is using so much data to kind of come to a conclusion, much more than we as an individual clinician could ever kind of entertain in our minds. Um, and one thing that was really uh, sort of striking is for the people who were classified as high risk, a staggering 40% went on in the next month to make a suicide attempt. So we have now gone ahead and built an app that can be integrated into the electronic health record at the point of care and can alert clinicians to a patient's individual level of risk and then guide them through the development of a personalized treatment plan. Um, and, you know, we've come a long way in just a few years from having this technology to actually being able to be in a position to implement it. Along with colleagues at uh, three other healthcare systems, we've also used these methods uh, using data from more than 3 million patients to develop algorithms that can predict the onset of bipolar disorder, which as I mentioned is important because most people go long time before they get the correct diagnosis. And the longer that goes, the worse the outcome. So uh, the individuals uh, who are uh, identified as very high risk in this model went on to have a 19-fold increased risk of bipolar disorder. 
What about preventing mood disorders in the first place? What can we tell people about how to, say, prevent the onset of depression based on what we know about risk factors? Well, uh, try not to have affected relatives. <laughs> Uh, if possible, avoid trauma in your childhood and just say no to drugs. So these are not super actionable things uh, that we can easily control. But with support from the Demarest Lloyd Foundation, uh, we have now conducted a series of large studies uh, using big data, including uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals and even genetic data, and have found two actionable factors that are causal and modifiable for the prevention of depression. Um, and what's even amazing is that regardless of your genetic risk for depression, which we can assess, or your history of trauma, these things are essentially equally protective. You want to guess what they are, anybody? Exercise? Those are all good guesses. So here's what they are physical activity or exercise, and social connection. And it turns out that each of these has very powerful effects. And you may hear, be hearing more about this in a moment. Um, for example, if you just replaced an hour of sedentary activity with an hour of moderate uh, physical activity like fast walking, uh, these analyses show you would uh, lower the risk of developing depression by more than 25%. So this is just some of the areas that we're trying to bring precision to in mood disorders to try to do better and what we can offer patients for uh, treatment and prevention and diagnosis. I'm personally thrilled to be part of a department that you've already seen is just extraordinary and is driving the field forward in these ways. And uh, I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. And I, um, I'm just super grateful to to all of you and to my colleagues uh, to be part of a place which I think is going to usher in this new era of precision psychiatry and hopefully improve a lot of lives. So thank you very much. I used, uh, I actually, I still have this joke, uh, which is, if you want three opinions, just ask two psychiatrists. Uh, and Jordan's helping us to uh, improve that. Anna Maria. Thank you everyone for having me here. I already have so many ideas of collaborations with Juan, Erica, and Jordan. So really, really excited. Um, life is fragile. With each year that passes, we and our loved ones have an exponentially higher chance of developing a serious illness. A serious illness is often traumatic and brings with it intense emotional distress. This distress can color how we live our last years, months, and days of our precious lives, and how those we leave behind adjust to life after we are gone. My father died of lung cancer. It was a long and exhausting journey filled with a relentless search for a cure. My mother transformed herself into a superwoman somehow managing to care my dad for my dad on top of her job, always with a smile on her face, my sunshine, as my father used to call her, doing everything she could to keep him comfortable, keep his hope for a cure alive, and keep him going every day through his treatments. My dad knew that he was dying, but he kept his distress buried inside of him. He didn't want to upset my mom. When he died, my mom collapsed into a deep depression that lasted over one year. Sure, there was normal grief about the hole left by my dad's death. They had been married for over 40 years, but there was more than that. There were years of neglecting her own needs to be 100% there for my dad. There were regrets about missed opportunities for conversations about my dad's last years of life and about how to manage his treatment. These negative consequences could have been prevented. Our healthcare system needs to do better to support us and our loved ones when we experience serious illness. 
we need a paradigm shift. Serious illness is a mind-body experience that brings with it intense emotional distress for both the person with a medical diagnosis and their family caregivers. We need to go beyond drugs, beyond surgeries, and beyond the search for a cure. My vision is to create a healthcare system where we treat the emotional functioning of the patient and their family caregivers with just as much care as we treat the patient's medical disease. I will tell you a story that highlights this vision. Seven years ago, I got a call from Tracy, the head nurse in the near ICU. She said, Anna Maria, can you come talk to this family? We have a 53-year-old male. He had a stroke. He's a retired history professor, very anxious, has three grown kids. His wife is here, very anxious. They don't want to leave his bedside. We're worried about them. I went to the ICU and met William and his wife, Laura. We talked. William showed considerable distress. He described himself as someone who had always been physically active and enjoyed taking care of others. He was frustrated about why he had a stroke, worried about having another stroke in the future, and also worried about the impact of the stroke on his family and his wife, Laura. Laura, on the other hand, described herself as strong under pressure and denied emotional distress. However, she could not leave William's bedside to get sleep, talk with friends, or exercise, things that she identified as very important for her emotional health. Anxiety was written on her face. We started our work together. We normalized William's frustration and Laura's reluctance to leave his bedside. We discussed emotional regulation skills. William was able to say, I can feel frustrated with my situation, and grateful that I'm alive. Laura was also able to say, I can keep faithful watch over William and take time for myself and trust that the medical system will keep him safe. I returned the next day to talk to the two of them together again. I learned that William had a history of untreated anxiety. He knew that he needed coping skills. His family knew that he was reluctant to talk about his anxiety and accept help, and they were thrilled that he finally wanted to accept help. I was happy. A stroke, a serious illness, can lead to positive change. William made good initial recovery and was transferred to rehab. We continued our work together over Zoom. We discussed how to communicate about his diagnosis with his family and friends how to navigate transitioning from a caretaker to being cared for, how to support his son who had recently become a father, and how to navigate the fear of stroke recurrence while still living a meaningful life. We identified that William's root for anxiety was concerned about being a burden on others and losing his independence. He didn't want to be like his parents who had required substantial care as they aged. William did not want this for his wife and for his kids. We were able to work through these worries and help him reframe some of his thoughts about becoming a burden or becoming like his parents as they aged. Laura also became able to understand that her reluctance to leave William's bedside and her constantly checking in with the medical team was rooted in anxiety and that she was trying to find a sense of control in the middle of so much uncertainty. The couple was able to, for the first time, engage in conversations and share their anxieties and worries with each other while using emotional regulation and other coping skills to support their emotional recovery individually and together as a couple. By the time we reached our last meeting and William was discharged home, both Laura and William felt at ease and prepared to support each other with skills as William continued his physical recovery. William and Laura's story inspired Recovering Together, the first evidence-based program that improves emotional distress in dyads of patients admitted to the neuroscience intensive care unit and their family caregivers. We developed Recovering Together with funding from the American Heart Association and from the National Institute of Health. We published more than 20 manuscripts supporting Recovering Together. The treatment manual for Recovering Together is being published this summer by Oxford Press.
William died a few weeks after our last meeting. Laura called me to share the news. She was proud that she was able to use one of the Recovering Together skills to share how she was feeling, devastated and grateful that she and William got to share a new level of closeness because of our work together. She shared that the skills of the program are helping her navigate William's loss and helping her find a new sense of meaning and purpose. Remember my vision to create a healthcare system where we treat the patient and the caregiver's emotional distress with just as much care as we treat the patient's medical disease? Recovering Together is an example of this new model of care that can only be found at MGH. We have now started to expand Recovering Together to other populations. We have adapted Recovering Together to support parents who have babies in the neonatal ICU, and we have developed Resilient Together to support patients with dementia, um, MS, and ALS, and their family caregivers. The model has traction. What we observed with William and Laura is being replicated with other serious illness diagnoses. I now share this work with my mother, who is still alive. She loves it. This work has allowed us to experience a new level of closeness and for her to process her grief surrounding my dad's last years of life. I want her future illness to be managed differently than my dad. And I want this for all of us in this room and for our families. Thank you. Okay, testing. Okay, we never know how this is going to go uh, uh, because there tends to be more questions than we have time. But we do have about uh, a half an hour before we break for lunch. So the drill is, the drill is, uh, like I say, we don't know how it's going to go, uh, is to raise your hand. I'll try and pick among them. It's not because I have uh, kitty biases against or for you. I'm just trying to mix it up uh, around the room. We've got mics that are around the room as well. And uh, and then I use Robert to tell me who I'm supposed to uh, call on. So uh, right there, uh, the, the lady with the glasses there. Good morning. Uh, this question is for Joanne. Um, a few years ago, we had a presenter at the council uh, talking about brain stimulation in a much more invasive way. And I'm just curious, is your technology just the next generation of this? Because it doesn't seem to have been very many years since that presentation where we all sat here thinking, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But this seems really amazing. And the second <laughs> part of my question is, um, do you find that, I don't know how old this technology is, but do you find that um, kids, especially teenage boys, young adult males who maybe don't want treatment, respond more favorably to your treatment? I think I'm going to have the mic on. Okay. Is this mic working? Yep. Yes. Yeah, great. So I think it was the second um, slide that had a continuum where there were three groups of treatments and the first ones were the surgical ones, the second one were the convulsive ones, and the third one were the non-invasive one. So what you're describing is part of what the, the first group of treatments are, the surgical ones. And for some patients, that makes sense. Um, often they're very sick, very severe, a very refractory type of patient with very specific criteria. There's a committee at NGH, the Psychiatric or Surgical Committee, where we evaluate these patients we always try to avoid the surgery. So we try to see what else has not been done that is less invasive. But there's some cases where the surgery is actually needed and recommended, and then we work together with our neurosurgeons to do that. And there's a series of treatments to do that. Of course, it's a lot more invasive, it has a lot more risks, a lot more expensive. It's not that many people can follow these patients after that. So the indications are much more narrow. These non-invasive treatments have way, way large indications because they're not surgical, they can be done, some in the clinic, some can be done at home. So you could say it's the next generation, but, but I wouldn't say that these novel non-invasive treatments, or not so novel, some of them, are here to substitute the surgical treatments. 
or sometimes people ask me, do you think this is going to substitute medications? And I think the goal here is not to substitute treatments that work, is to develop more options, more treatment, so that then we can go with this precision psychiatry approaches to figure out who is the best candidate for what treatment, and not have this kind of one-size-fits-all approach, but try to understand the individuality of a patient, the individuality of the brain-based mechanisms that lead them to having symptoms, and engaging those patient-specific uh, mechanisms. So it's just one more tool. It's very exciting because it's not invasive. It's very exciting because to a certain extent it can be done at home. Um, but I wouldn't say it's here to substitute. It was in the same family. And in terms of the second patient, second question, um, we just started um, exploring applications in children, and um, and so far it's been quite successful. We, you know, we're discussing this earlier with Erica that um, it's, you know, we didn't know when we started whether. Oh, better. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't know. Um, could you hear what I said? <laughs> Can I repeat? Um, we um, we didn't know if patients and parents would feel that. Oh, I absolutely prefer this because it's not a medication; it's not systemic. Or then we have some concerns because what is this new technology of stimulating our kids' brains? But so far, it it's been well accepted in the studies that we've been having, and we're seeing that patients do respond well in in a similar way that we're seeing with adults. Although I think there's some open questions still that we're trying to address with with our research. Okay, Robert, next, do we have it over there? Yep. Hold on. Okay. And we'll pass this to whoever it is. This well, this is uh, the in, uh, continuation for you. Uh, uh, are these non-invasive approaches used daily, and for what length of time do they work? Right. <laughs> we will perfect. This can you hear me. Yeah. Great. So um, we are. Yes, they're daily, um, and we're doing those finding studies, but uh, so far what we're doing is patients use this for 20 minutes a day. Um, the, the, the treatment that I discussed and the one that I showed, but you can do it at home. So you can incorporate that as part of your morning routine when you're having breakfast or your evening routine if you're just watching TV. Um, because it's done at home, it can, be do, it can be done Monday through Sunday, so every day. Uh, we're seeing that it can be done twice a day, even three times a day. It's safe. We're trying to understand what patients may need more than once a day. And we're also playing with doses, right? So there's a range of electrical currents. They're all really, really weak currents. Um, so that's why they're so safe. And um, But this a range of weak currents that we can go up and down that, again, can be adjusted uh, as a function of, of a given patient. Um, some of these treatments happen in the clinic. Things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, that's actually a proof for depression, a proof for OCD, a proof for smoking cessation. This is no research anymore. We just do this for care. Um, and those treatments happen every day, but Monday through Friday usually, not on weekends, and typically for six weeks in a row. Yes. <laughs> First of all, thanks to all of you because you have. Your, one of your colleagues has transformed our family's life. And, um, you know, we went to a lot of places before, unfortunately. And I would have questions for all of you, but for Dr. Smoller, um, the micro data, you know, we know that these companies are getting so much data about us that they can target us specifically. To what extent will you be able to hone your research to say, I don't know, hypothetically, a Latina bipolar woman who was in a high pressure situation, whatever, you know, uh, with whatever, would you be able to then target and say, well, this is the med for you, Lamictal, or this is the med for you, or this is the treatment you need, or, you know, this is what's missing in your life? I mean, how tight can you get with this? Yeah. And because that would be transformative. Yes, um, I agree. Well, that's one of the advantages of, of having all these big data because you can find patterns and they may not fall into categories that we have previously thought of like the example that you just gave um, but that allow us to match the treatment to that particular patient's profile 
or to patients who are similar to that patient. And, you know, for example, when we do these models of predicting things like suicide risk, some of the features that come up as influential are not things we would have thought of before. And that's part of why it's useful, because we didn't think of those things before. So the more uh, data and experience we get, and the, frankly, the better the artificial intelligence and machine learning get, um, the more we can incorporate you know, factors that really make it precise to, if not that exact person, somebody who's you know, within a narrow range of that profile, much more than what we're doing now, which is kind of guesswork, frankly, in many cases. So Jordan, Jordan, when I first met you, all you did was talk about big data. So now we're talking about big data and artificial intelligence, which uh, we've all learned a lot about in the past couple of years. But taking uh, Donna's question one step farther, how how are you going to implement your uh, what you're doing, the app and everything else, into let's say the primary care? How are we going to access this? When is this going to start to happen? Let's get on it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We need you. We need you. Feel this the to same happen. way that you do. Yeah. Um, that is actually the what we often call the the last mile, which is very difficult. So we, you know, we've spent all this time, we've developed the tools, we've actually, as I said, built this app, which can be integrated, fits with the usual medical records that we all use, could be available to the clinician at the point of care. The actual implementation is the thing that we now need to work on. And some of that requires, you know, proving to the healthcare system and doing some additional research that shows you know, with this thing versus without, people do better. So we actually did pilot this already, uh, the suicide version in the emergency department in one of our hospitals, and it was really positive. And so now we're gearing up to do those trials, which we hope will show that using these kinds of tools um, are cost-effective, useful to people, et cetera. And then it's a matter of, you know, aligning the incentives of the system. Clinicians are very busy, so you want something that is helpful to them, but not adding the burden. And we really think this is something that would be helpful to people because we're often in this state of uncertainty. Um, that's what we need to do. I totally agree. Jim, back there on the aisle. If either speak up or somebody will run to you with the mic. <laughs> So I've got a double header. Uh, Dr. Camperton, from the beginning of the therapy with the uh, treatment that you described, how long before there are results that begin to appear? And the second point, you don't have to make a comment, but I'd suggest that you move from a Darth Vader hood to something closer to Disney. <laughs> so for kids, we have a Disney cow like that, that has the, has the ears and has the colors. So it's a bit darker for adults, but for kids, it's the designers have been working with us and it's a bit more thoughtful. So um, I don't have pictures of that, but it's actually pretty cute. Um, and in terms of the timeline, um, it does vary. And we've been actually trying to use some of these machine learning methods now to try to identify if, if there are profiles of patients that can we can predict what pattern of response, what temporal pattern of response they will have. Most patients will slowly, relatively linearly get better. But some patients get well in the first week very rapidly, and then they stay well. And then the last group is the more difficult one because some patients may not get well, may not get well, may not get well. And maybe by week four, we start starting to see some changes. Maybe instead of six weeks, we need to do more and eventually they get well. And this last group is the most difficult one because hindsight is always 2020. But when you're working with this patient, it's week two, it's week three, it's not working. What do you do? Do you say, it's not gonna work, let's move on. Or do you say, let's hold hands, let's keep going. Let's wait a little bit. And we typically do the latter, but uh, like most things in medicine and even more in 
brain medicine in psychiatry, there's a lot of uncertainty that we have to manage together with the patients and with the families, and, and we're hoping to narrow down the uncertainty. But there's, there's a wide range of response, although I would say the most typical one is the more linear one. Well, by week two, we started to see some changes, but week four, the significant changes, it's clear that it's working. We're not where we want to be, but we're getting there. And by week six or so, we, we get to a response. Thank you. One more question, Dr. Smoller. Uh, on artificial intelligence, wow. But could you give us some context of time? Uh, the context being, when did you begin this business? Where are you now? And what do you think is coming in a timeline? I know in terms of research, but in terms of precision, precision diagnosis, where do you think, will we be there before I'm dead? <laughs> and, and all of you, you are the A-team, thank you. Thank you, thank you for those comments. Um, well, that, that is what's sort of unbelievable to me is how things have moved in the last, because it, it was a while ago and it was actually partnering with um, the Demarest Lloyd Foundation, with the Tommy Fuss family, uh, that uh, at, at events like this, where, you know, many of these kinds of things at the time seemed kind of, you know, no way. Um, and you can't really get NIH funding to do those things because they're too preliminary. And so it did take a while. I mean, we really started, uh, well, I hate to say it, you know, about a decade ago. And then all of these things had to be accumulated, all the evidence, all the technology, all the skill, building the team, et cetera. But what's been so remarkable, and the other area that I do a lot of work in is genetics, and this happened in genetics as well, that it sort of hit this inflection point. And now the level of understanding of the potential of artificial technology and just the, the technology itself is advancing at such a scale. People are probably aware of chat GPT that's been in the news. Um, our model that uses, uh, that predicts treatment response uses that same idea of these large language models. So um, I think the implementation is coming in the foreseeable future. It's already happened in some other areas of medicine where people are using these algorithms. Um, in psychiatry, I think there's a little extra hurdle where we need to have people understand that this can inform treatment. It's not going to replace clinicians. It's not going to, but it could really make a difference. And um, that I think is probably a five-year process at least. And then, but meanwhile, the whole, you know, technology is moving faster. Who knows? It might be shorter. That's what we thought in genetics. It would take you know, 20 years, something that ended up taking a few years. So it is a little bit of a slow process because you want to feel confident that what you're introducing is uh, free of bias, for example, which is a concern in these things, and really effective and prove that. Um, but I think we're, you know, we've got a tool now that is, we've already deployed, basically. Thank you. Robert, back there, okay. Um, I have a question for, um, th first of all, thank you for this very stimulating um, conference. It was, and I wanted to ask a question about stimulation, the TMS. Um, since so often people with um, some type of uh, mental illness also have addiction issues like drugs and alcohol and eating and whatnot. Have you done any research um, or had any experience with people with addiction? And if you haven't, what do you think uh, might be a benefit? Right. So we we did a study good 10, 15 years ago where we showed that TMS can reduce cravings in cocaine users, which is one step towards stopping use. Um, and right now we have some studies with this very same technology that I tested on, on uh, smokers and on marijuana users, and we're going to be moving towards opiates. And the goal here is twofold. One is, like I sh we show for cocaine, we can reduce the cravings, we can reduce that unlocked, unregulated desire to use, or we can reduce the control of those desires. We can reduce our, we can we can increase the control. We can increase the capacity to say, not now. I'm going to look at rewards and pleasures that are not here now, but going to happen sometime in the future. And these two cognitive strategies have 
different biological mechanisms and with these devices because to the extent that we understand the circuits the brain regions that process that here now drive of reward the craving to use versus the capacity to control it we can modulate one or the other to the point that actually tms has been fda approved two years ago for the treatment of smoking cessation so it's the first addiction that actually gets an, an the, the stamp of the FDA, right? This is now proven to be safe and effective in large trials, and it can be marketed and can be used in clinics. Um, so I would say addiction is is a very hot topic in brain stimulation, and there is a lot of increasing evidence. I think we're pretty close probably to have TMS approved for alcohol use disorders as well. Um, and there's a lot of very compelling evidence coming for uses of different substances and also for treating patients at different stages of the addiction process when they're using when they just stop using when they've been out for a number of years you know they all have their own vulnerabilities they all have their own biological signatures and they all have their own treatment needs and and i think there's strategies that we can develop with brain stimulations for all of them thank you um my daughter uh, when she's pregnant, does great. Um, and then when she's not, deals with a lot of things that you discussed. Um, how close are we to being able to go in and evaluate what the hormones, the gene changes, et cetera, that are going on in her body that allow us to be able to identify exactly what she needs in the way of drugs? Dr. Cole. So, uh, Mac, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I think that, uh, we're getting closer. And so, and because, uh, we, we've said in the public domain, I'm exquisitely familiar with the case that you describe. And so, um, and it's been extraordinary that, uh, someone would do as well, uh, in pregnancy. Um, and because, we, we've shown and, and others have shown that pregnancy is not protective. Actually, patients who have uh, depression and anxiety disorders and other psychiatric illnesses, um, if they stop the treatments that got them well, whether it was psychotherapy, medications, frequently relapses the rule during pregnancy. Uh, but there are cases where patients say, I never felt as well as I did when I was pregnant. And then postpartum, they uh, relapse and they relapse dramatically as the case um, that you described described. What I'm excited about, and really, Joanne, it goes a little bit to your comments, is um, with philanthropic funding, uh, we have been able to partner with our colleagues in neuroimaging at Mass General to look at what happens postpartum and are there changes in the brain using certain uh, technologies that we look in various aspects of the brain to see what underlies uh, the, the types of mood disorders that we see in women who are postpartum. Uh, postpartum depression is the most common complication in modern obstetrics, and some of you may have followed. Uh, we've had a tragedy in Massachusetts um, in the last uh, two weeks um, with a woman who experienced postpartum psychosis. So we're very excited about trying to move forward and to really understand at the level of the brain in terms of what's going on um, in various aspects of the brain and actually to see because we're also connecting, uh, we're also collecting data um, uh, from DNA to see what is the genetic underpinning uh, for some of what we're seeing in women with postpartum uh, depression. And I'm optimistic because I think that what you heard today and particularly in Jordan's comments, it's not gonna be just one thing. Uh, it's going to be a certain piece in the genetic space combined with what Joanne was talking about in terms of uh, certain aspects of the brain, and then to sort of come up with what will the treatment be that will mitigate uh, risk. And in the case that you described, in such a critical time for women and families like the postpartum period. John, Dr. Fava. Uh, so it's a great question. And I think that um, <clears throat> one hypothesis is that uh, there may be, a, in, in some women, a production of neurosteroids. Neurosteroids are substances that we produce as kind of human beings. They seem to modulate mood. And, um, and you know, there are companies now that are trying to actually mimic those neurosteroids. Uh, one of them got one product approved as Brexanol for postpartum depression 
the same company just submitted an oral formulation called Zoranol that may get approved for postpartum depression. Again, leveraging that knowledge that somehow hormones and these neurosteroids may contribute to either when they drop uh, in the postpartum period to postpartum depression and during pregnancy in some women, they may confer that protection. I'm going to take my privilege here for a question. <laughs> but uh, as I was looking at this panel, and uh, those of you who've been coming here for years, the panel changes. Uh, and as Lee points out, uh, the dazzlement continues. And I was thinking about, so I'm glad it got over to you, Maurizio, who is uh, our chair, and Jerry, uh, who uh, what has been our chair is still among us, what it's like uh, to be with a department that has, I would say, the, the, the metaphor I was thinking about is uh, to be the conductor of a symphony orchestra, where you have so many superior instruments and the task is uh, how to coordinate them. We even heard today some of our panelists saying, oh, I, you've got something, I'd like to work with you. What's that like to be the conductor of this orchestra? Well, John, it, it, you know, it, it's first of all, it's an honor because, you know, it's an incredible uh, group of people who are making a tremendous difference. But it's also, it's kind of, uh, it's very exciting because, you, you know, you saw today, this is, a, this is incredible work. I mean, and, and so uh, it, it is an orchestra because we're, uh, you know, we're working together as uh, teams, but you have soloists, you have people who are, who can uh, dazzle you with their, you know, their, their work. And so I think, you know, there's no more exciting time, uh, you know, I feel uh, than now to be in psychiatry and to be the department that we are. So uh, uh, it's, it's hard to express, uh, you know, the, the level of excitement that it produces. So uh, I'm uh, 42 years here, and uh, I get all the fun of knowing and listening to all these people every day. And I can see, Lee, you are you got something to say? You know, just, um, no, this will be good. Um, yeah, this will be good. Um, you know, uh, those of us who've been at MGH for a long time, people say, how is it that you stayed there for you know, for three decades, um, because many of us have, uh, frankly, had opportunities to go to other places. And so, and it's a good question. Um, I think we are one of the least siloed departments of any major academic department of psychiatry in America. And we're not siloed, frankly, because of the leadership of Jerry Rosenbaum that uh, preceded Dr. Fava and people, and because Mauricio is, is too modest, Mauricio gets 500 emails a day. Um, and, and answers uh, them in 24 hours. And answers them in 24 hours. And <laughs> exactly. And, and um, for those of you who read Malcolm Gladwell, is the consummate connector. And so I think that the collegiality that I hope you sort of feel today that it just even on this uh, podium, and uh, it's it's really because of the leadership uh, where we're not siloed and people are encouraged to collaborate. And that's why Anna Maria was so excited and, and Erica, um, we're excited to collaborate and we effectively collaborate because when there's crosstalk, uh, because I'm not a neuroimager and I don't do the work that Joanne does, uh, but as we sort of start to work together in an interdisciplinary way, we really are going to crack the problems that we've been talking about. Uh, but it's really, it, it comes from the top. It's just, we still won't say that. All right. So remember, we're going to have lunch and we can hang out and you can talk with them individually. And then after this, and we'll give you your emails and all that. So you have the honor of the last question uh, before Donna and Patty close it up. <laughs> Well, I'm going to then keep it short because I had six questions. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, talking about the conductor, just two nights ago, I saw the movie Tar. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you should see it uh, with Kate Blanchett. Um, talking about uh, the unconscious bias and Kitty, you did a wonderful job. Um, just not to go into too much detail, but there's so many because of COVID, there's so many young people uh, in their 20s and 30s that are presenting with, I've been exposed to mold. Maybe it's Lyme, maybe it's POTS, 
maybe it's long haul COVID, and um, they're having a lot of problems. Um, they don't live in your community. They're all over the country. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it with that question. How do they get, I know how they get to you, but how could they work in their local community um, to then eventually get to you? And I think, okay. I think Dr. Cohen, you, uh, uh, you talked about this, but the brain imaging, right? Uh, where MGH has a program with the brain Im imaging, and, and you have the PBS doctor, Dr. Amen, who has the brain imaging clinics all over the United States, right? So do you look at that as almost like a blood draw to see what your A1C numbers and, and uh, all the triglycerides, et cetera, uh, do you do, if you're in Sarasota, Florida, do you do an Amen Clinic brain scan to then bring it to you all just like a blood work because that's sort of standard. So what would you do? How would you suggest the patient that's presenting with all these problems um, and not getting an answer and not getting diagnosed and has this, there's this unbiased conscious in their local community. What do they do, right? We'll let, we'll let the, the chair, the chief, close it. Well, that's a great question. I think that you know the the reality is that uh, we we cannot take calls from the entire country. So it's you know there's a reality that we can take calls from some people, and clearly we're we try to do our best to be responsive. And and in some ways, uh, anybody who's a friend of yours will will uh, <laughs> will take the call. But uh, you know there is the reality of of you know, diagnosing psychiatric disorders is still a challenge in the community. Uh, the use of imaging tools, you know, there are clinics that leverage that, but they've not really demonstrated the reliability of their approaches. So is that, you know, uh, you can talk to Juan afterwards, uh, you know, he, he can comment on the, on the specifics, but I, I think fundamentally, uh, the big solution will be big data, it will be Jordan's work that uh, can be deployed uh, using electronic health record anywhere in the country. Uh, the big solution will be uh, digital apps that can uh, uh, refine diagnostically, you know, people can take tests in a digital app uh, and supplement what's in the electronic health record. And our Center for Digital Mental Health is working on that. And, and, and finally, you know, it's, it's really, there is still the human clinical factor. I know as much as we can get all this information, it's the doctor that, you know, that doesn't have that, that bias, I guess, in a way, the doctor listens to the patient that establishes a good report. So it's not all about the technology, it's also about the human factor and it's something that we value very much in Mass General. So thank you. Erica, you want to take us out? John? Uh, look, see, this is it. I, I can't control this group <laughs> and I don't want to. No, I think uh, all of the questions are excellent. And it's a really excellent and important question of, uh, you know, we touch, the, the goal is to affect and, and help as many people as we can with, with where we are right now. And um, one of the things that I think is so important also is education. And so, you know, we have the MGH Psychiatry Academy, but one of the things that I think is so important is, you know, Tourette, it's a very niche field. There's not a lot of child psychiatry experts who specialize in it, but the more you can get out the knowledge of what to look for so that you don't end up with multiple misdiagnoses, the sooner you can spread that so that it can get into the communities. So I always envision a sort of levels of care where ideally you, you are able to, you know, consults, that there can be sort of a formal consultation method, but really it's about spreading the knowledge of what to look for, what is the gold standard data, you know, what what are the treatments we should be using, and then um, continuing to work and getting it to all the nooks and crannies uh, in the country. So thank you, panel. And uh, we have Patty and Donna coming up. One more, one more time you're hearing from us. Um, and we want to greatly thank Drs. Fava, Cohen, and Herman for leading that riveting discussion. 
it's always inspiring to hear the consistently groundbreaking work going on at MGH Psychiatry. And um, Lee, you mentioned the siloed approach, and there's a really um, compelling article in the New York Times today that talks about suicide and how difficult it is to speak to a friend who might be going through a severely depressed episode, and the siloed or lack of approach is is referred to in that article. I would encourage everyone to to take a look. It's it's quite an an interesting one, um, and um, you know you you mentioned every year is the best, but that's because we are the best, and and we have we are the largest, and we 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 need to shout that from the rooftops because it's it's so true. Coming to this hospital for your care, hearing guidance from any of these physicians is is we're all lucky to be here and, and be able to to hear that cutting edge work. So thank you all. And and to Anna Maria, we we so rarely hear about the caregiver and we we so rarely hear and we heard from Kitty today how hard it is to bring it all together. And the work that you're doing, I look forward to hearing and reading Recovering Together and 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 being one of those people. I can tell you that it, it's a challenging position to be in and thank you for trying to shift the paradigm. It's, it's about time. Um, so before we head to lunch, I wanna thank all of these renowned physicians for their time and their fascinating presentations. I'm sure every listener here this morning is awed by the incredibly dynamic research which you're all advancing. Remaining informed about current events in mental health care is an essential step to end the endemic and improve the lives of those who need help the most, eradicating stigma so those most impacted seek the help which they need is imperative. To that end, and in an effort to expand knowledge and understand mental illnesses, as was mentioned last evening, the MGH Psychiatry Leadership Council will soon be posting regularly on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Everyone can be kept abreast. And Kitty, I'm sure that I speak for everyone here today when I share my heartfelt gratitude to today's patient speaker. Your story was not only inspirational, it was delivered courageously and gracefully and and with such such eloquence um and and, and will no doubt <laughs> and, and it will no doubt inspire all of us here today sh to share our own stories with others in an effort to fervently combat mental health stigma and and i think every one of us here is going to think about unconscious bias in a different way. Thank you, Kitty. Um, just to... Our hero. Um, today we heard from many that the Department of Psychiatry's dedication to its patients is really its secret sauce. You guys are amazing. Um, it's really what makes this work so special. For every decision and scientific breakthrough, Dr. Fava and his team ensure the patient always comes first, which is why each treatment provides so much hope. I know I speak for all of us when I say that it is an honor to continue to support the department's work. I'm so proud to be part of it and to be among all of you, my fellow members of the Leadership Council, your dedication is changing the future of psychiatry by increasing access to care, reducing stigma in our society, and raising awareness. I hope every person in the room takes great pride in today's seminar, because much of what you heard and saw in these presentations are, result, are a result of your generosity and commitment. You are saving lives, and for that, we are all incredibly grateful. That concludes our program today. We thank you and look forward to your joining us in the next room for lunch.